<laughs> yes. Hey guys. Chris, hey, how's hey, it Chris, going, how buddy? Good, good. It's going good. Awesome. Wow. Listen to that voice, so, man. Uh, yeah, exactly. I was going to say. <laughs> uh, how's life? Uh, life is really good. You know, I got a good night's sleep and got prepared for our time together. So beautiful. Yeah. There's a, a concept that got downloaded to me maybe eight, 10 years ago. And the concept was let the moment be the master. Mm. And so that means I had to shut my mind off and allow the moment to dictate. And, you know, my sense of mastery is to give no more or no less than what the moment is asking for. Good afternoon there, Christopher. Welcome to the Ridiculously Human podcast. Thank you. I'm we happy to be a, here. Thank you, us too. We had a little story of how we got to chat with you. We, we had heard such amazing things about you during our interviews with uh, the two absolute legends and previous guests, Shelley Paxton and Mandy Leto. Uh, and they couldn't have spoken more highly of you. So we're really excited to be chatting with you. Well, I feel blessed to be able to have their, um, their honoring of me in this way because I really enjoy having them in my life. They're both two amazing leaders, two really upfront and honest women that are really leaning into the edge and um, doing their best to help people grow beyond their limitations and putting themselves out there. Totally. They, they, they both said, you know, we, we're not exactly sure what he does but he's like a true healer and a sage and they've never felt better. So we were like, we had to, we had to just have a conversation with you. And that's why we're so excited to do that today. So uh, <laughs> that's funny because you know, my, in, in those communities, I'm either referred to as a wizard or I'm referred to as the enigma. <laughs> <laughs> oh, beautiful well that's that's exactly the the sort of way they described you that like we don't know what he's doing but i feel amazing <laughs> <laughs> uh, classic so uh christopher and just to kick off your story not many adults have really dealt with their shadow um but you had a moment as a five-year-old uh when you saw your shadow and it spoke to you and it said that uh, you would lead a mystical life so Looking back on that moment, uh, do you think your shadow was correct? My shadow was absolutely correct. The thing is, is that at the time, I really was unclear what a mystical life was. You know, I was, I think I was about nine. And um, I was coming back from what's called summer recreation. I went to a boarding school in Pennsylvania named Milton Hershey School. And I was coming back and I was turning to the left and as I turned to the left, I saw my shadow for the first time. And then my shadow was speaking to me. And uh, it turned out that my shadow was correct. You know, it's funny, you know, when you're going along, I've had all these amazing experiences as a young adult. And the things that crystallized in my mind were those types of experiences. Like I couldn't remember who was at my seventh grade birthday party, but I remember that moment very clearly. Christopher, like, can you can you maybe explain like what is a what what is a shadow like? <laughs> you know exactly. You know, it's uh, the sun was off to my left shoulder, and it was pushing my shadow onto the blacktop over here to the right, and I was looking at my shadow, and then I heard this voice that said, "You will have a mystical life," and you know, you shake your head thinking like, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> And, um, and I went on a journey after that. Mm. Wow. Classic. And, and do you actually sort of delve into the shadow nowadays with the work that, uh, with the healing work that you do these days? Yes, I totally do. You know, the thing um, about the work that I do is this. Most people are afraid to really look at their shadow or to go into their shadow. The challenge is, is that your light lives in your shadow. So you have to be willing to go into the shadow to retrieve your essence, to retrieve your light. Because most people are happy with the sun. 
but they have a very difficult time with the contrast of the moon. Okay, they feel good about themselves when they're perfect and they feel terrible about themselves when they're imperfect. And so my work is to really get people to love both aspects of themselves. And when that happens, the light that's in the middle of your shadow, it begins to grow and it gets extremely bright. And then what happens is the shadow disappears. So it disappears no. completely or like, you know, is it just becomes kind of less dark or something? It, yeah, it, be, it, be, it becomes less dark, right? It's, it's, it dominates your experience less. Mm. Okay, mm. because, you know, one of the challenges, especially being in a Western world, is that people are highly critical of themselves. And I know this, I ran a lot of guilt and a lot of shame. Uh, people disapprove of themselves, people judge themselves unfairly, people even take overly moralizing positions over themselves. And they're expecting to be perfect, to do everything right the first time. And, you know, my message is really simple. Failure is the greatest part of success. And so rather than disapprove, why don't you look at the benefit of tripping and falling on your face. Mm -hmm. If you're running down the stairs too fast and you trip in your fall, well, good for you because that bruise is gonna remind you that, whoa, if I'm going down steps that are too short and I'm going too quick, the chances of me hitting myself are pretty good. So maybe what I'll do is when I get into that same situation, I'll take a deep breath and I'll slow down. And I'll try to take in what the moment is attempting to teach me. Because when I, I'll make it personal, whenever I was judging myself, criticizing myself, and disapproving of myself, I was competing with God. Okay, source and spirit were attempting to show me something, and I was competing. And when you compete with source, with God, with spirit, however you think about it, you end up losing that battle. Because they're, they're, the collective field has way too much energy. And so you've got to learn to get in the groove with what the moment wants to teach you. Sure. So how do you, how do you get into that groove? Well, one, you have to build the trust. And what that means is you have to fire yourself from being the commander. And you have to trust that you and God, you and source, you and spirit are here to co-create your experience together. And that everything in your life is a co-created effort. Like when you sit down to eat, you're co-creating with your knife, your fork, your plate, your spoon, your cup, all of the food. You're co-creating an experience. When you're going to sleep, you're co-creating with your pillow, your blanket. When you're going to bathroom, I mean, this sounds foul. You're co-creating with everything that's involved in that process. When you're showering, you're co-creating with your soap and your scrub brush and your shampoo and your conditioner. Everything is a co-creative process. And there's so many things at play that you have to step back for a second and go, hey, okay, who am I co-creating with? What are we co-creating and how can I show up in, in a powerful way? In a powerful way is to allow the moment to be the master, to allow the moment to speak to you, to direct you. And when you make a mistake and you fall flat on your face to go, okay, there's benefit here. Yes, I don't like the chip in my front tooth, but you know what? I'm going to remember this moment because there's something valuable to learn here. Hmm. it's a beautiful it's special way because a lot of people um yeah a lot of people kind of say we need to work together teamwork you know let's let's work as a team and and there's something that resonates with that but the way you've put it now is that literally everything you do all day with whatever not you know, objects included is part of that process so it's a, a form of like being mindful of that all the time will get yeah. you to a place where you're uh, yeah, just in much more flow and, and in sync with the, with the world and the universe. Yeah, you know, here, here's, here's like a really uh, basic example. 
when I would drive up to a client's house, so the way that my work started is I would drive to them and work on them in their homes. And on the way there, I would listen to music. And then at some point I realized the music that I was listening to was affecting the session that I was doing before I actually got to the session. Mm. So then I made the decision that, okay, anytime I'm in my car, and I'm getting ready to drive to work on somebody in their home, I don't want any music on in the car. Hmm. And so I made the choice that you know, what I was going to co-create before I got to that experience was, I'm gonna have musical silence. And that's gonna allow me to get into a state of mindfulness to already start tuning into the experience. Because the music that I was listening to was so edgy that it would take me maybe 12 to 15 minutes for my nervous system to calm down enough so that when I was with them, I could actually be present with who they were. And so I had to make the choice to no longer to co-create with music before I got to my sessions. That's a basic example of how everything in your environment is impacting you and you got to make a choice who and what you want to co-create with. Yeah, cool. So Chris, is that like, um, I guess these interactions you're talking about, like uh, kind of just two thoughts on it, like is, is this an exchange of energy um, sort of in each interaction that we have? Is that, is that kind of what you're talking about? And then also, That's or, exactly what I'm talking about. And you've yeah. got to decide because whatever you choose to co-create with, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have two effects on you. It's either going to put you in the protective mode or it's going to put you in the receptive mode. Okay. And so for me, I had to make the decision, look, people are paying, they're spending their time, they're spending their energy and they're spending their resources to get me to help them get to a place that they can only imagine. And so if I show up and I've been listening to some really heavy music and it takes me 12 to 15 minutes to get into the flow with them and we're only meeting for an hour, they're really paying for 48 minutes of my time and my energy. Mm -hmm. And so I had to make a more conscious decision because there's a part of me that felt like I am not sure that they're getting the best value out of me. And so then I made that choice. It would be the same as if um, when I first started doing the work, I made the choice to no longer partake in alcohol. Okay. And the reason for that was really simple because I recognized the next day when I woke up, I was not fully present. And so here they are, they're showing up to do work with me and it's taken me till one o'clock in the afternoon to come around to be totally available. Yet I've got people showing up to receive the work at 10 AM in the morning. So I had decided that I wanted to give them good, I wanted to give them better value. And when I was having a couple of drinks the night before, I was definitely in the protective mode, which means I wasn't in the receptive mode. And if I'm outside of being in the receptive mode, it's impossible for me to co-create with the moment. Because now I'm actually behind the moment, right? I'm mean, think about it. There's four orientations of time. There's present day to day there's future, there's past, and then there's present day to day relative to all lifetimes, which would be considered timeless. So here I am, I'm in a moment with you guys now, okay? If I made the choice to get hopped up on sugar or caffeine or alcohol or any of those substances, what would happen is I would not be fully present with you right now. A whole aspect of myself would be in the protective mode because those substances would have put my nervous system in a state of fight or flight. And when you're in fight or flight, it's impossible to be receptive. Hmm. There's two base states. I'm either in a protective mode or I'm in the receptive mode. And so if I want to serve as powerfully as I can, I have to do everything that I can to get into the receptive mode, which means I got to be mindful of what substances I choose to co-create with. It's really valuable stuff there, but I think if we could all be more conscious of, you know, the state we're in, then we could have sort of much more fluid and um, 
valuable conversations or, or interactions or whatever it was, you know. Um, but I guess it's guys like you, you know, that, that need to teach us these things, I think. So, <laughs> so it's, a, it's, it's a good yeah. reminder, you know what I mean? Or even yeah, a, a good awakening for people to know these things. Mm, you're absolutely correct. I mean, it means for me personally, I will get more value out of the moment. Mm. And I, I will get oh, more value out of the moment and what i want is i want to get the greatest amount of value out of every moment that i'm in because it's about the connection right it's about the relating it's about the impact and if i'm present you're present with me because why all nervous systems in the collective field vibrate to the highest functioning nervous system. Mm. Did you know that? No, that's amazing. I, I love it. But it's yeah, powerful. so it's like it's powerful, right? So let's say we decided, hey, let's meet in Sonoma Valley. We're gonna go on a wine tasting, and then we're gonna go down and see the Dalai Lama. Well, we're gonna think to ourselves, like, hey, why don't we get him a great case of wine? We're gonna put that into the trunk of our car. We're gonna drive all the way down to San Francisco. We're gonna to get to the convention center. As soon as we get close to the parking lot, we are gonna realize he's never gonna drink that wine because now we're underneath his energetic envelope. Hmm. So when you put the time into yourself to be grounded, to be present, and you're choosing what substances that you're co-creating with, you now are extremely valuable to every person that you interact with. <laughs> and now healing and integration and personal growth, it shifts from a skill to a presence. Because when my presence is present, we're available to surf and access the frequency of peace and stillness calm, serenity, and tranquility. And when we're in those states, we're in the receptive mode. It means I can hear you, I can feel you, I can connect to you. Because at the end of the day, I mean, it sounds corny to some people, yet at the end of the day, it always comes back to love. But you are speaking our language, I promise you. Like, <laughs> uh, literally... <laughs> The audios between Greg and I recently, like on WhatsApp, has just been all about like how powerful love is, you know, and the importance yeah. of spreading more love in the world. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's so great to hear you say that. Um, especially at the moment, hey, Gareth. Yeah, especially at the moment. And actually, sorry, just one second, Craig, I sent you a, uh, yesterday, I sent you a quote. I'm trying to remember what it was uh, about energy. Your energy speaks before you do. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah, I, 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 yes. It, it, it's, uh, but if, just give me, two, oh, here we go. Your energy will it, yeah. always speak before you do. And I was like, wow, that's almost sort of tying in with exactly what you just said there, Chris. Christopher, that, sorry. That, <laughs> I keep on saying I Chris, mean, sorry, yeah, buddy. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I mean, you, uh, you've distilled it down, right? Mm -hmm. You've distilled that teaching into a very clear, concise statement. Your energy speaks before you do. Mm. It's absolutely there another, true. There was another thing I read uh, or heard not too long ago. It was the term was a, being a primary oscillator. And yes. what, 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 what I loved about that was the story goes that in a store where you have a whole bunch of grandfather clocks, the ticking of the clocks, they eventually start to sync, which is mm -hmm. amazing to the same tick tock of the, of the clocks. But yeah. one of those, one of those clocks leads that, you know, the back and forth and becomes the primary oscillator. And in an environment of people, you can also choose, as you were saying, Christopher, to be the primary oscillator, have your energy be the one that, if, listen, if there's two people sitting there, one of you is going to tap into the other energy and you can choose to maybe be that one that has the higher energy and, and, uh, and just bring more of that kind of good stuff in any interaction and then people vibe more with, with that energy. So I also like that analogy, which is exactly what you were saying is very, very powerful opportunity to make that choice day to day. 
Yes, and it, you know, those choices are made, you know, to take it a little deeper, those choices are made weeks, months, and years before we even get to that moment. And so the thing to be mindful of is all of the choices that I'm making today are going to be impacting something or someone tomorrow mm -hmm. or months from now or years from now. And so as I start to refine my vessel, as I start to strip out the tension and the stress and the distortion and the confusion and the anger and the anxiety and the self-righteous positions, what happens is I'm of greater use and of greater value. I started to tell everyone that I met 15 years ago that consciousness would be the new gold. Mm -hmm. Consciousness would be the new gold because people would begin to really understand that consciousness is what has value. And so when you're conscious, what it implies is that you're more present and you have to look at what are the things in my life that are keeping me from being present? Is it the way that my mom used to communicate and talk to me when I was a child? Is it... Uh, is it the way that the kids around the neighborhood used to bully me? Is it the foods that my grandmother used to feed me when I would stay at her house on the weekends? Like, what are the things that were impacting me when I was really young that are now what I call subconscious drivers? Mm -hmm. They're driving my ship in an area where I really have no desire to be there consciously yet i continue to keep ending up in this place and so to sum this all up we have to be mindful of the past and how it's impacting our present and when we do that it now means we get to take a heartfelt action and make a different choice Yeah, nothing more important than kind of looking at what has defined us, you know, to help us kind of find a bit more, you know, uh, just, just, just to find, just to put ourselves in a better place in the future. Um, so, but just to go back to your story a little bit, you obviously learned a hell of a lot of lessons in your life and specifically early on in your life. Uh, and one yes. of them was um, when you had a, I think it's called a house mother at a boarding school. Um, yes. and, and she gave you the space to feel comfortable in your environment because she noticed that you had a slight speech impediment. Could you yes. tell us a little bit more about that story, please? Yes, I could. Uh, her <laughs> Cleta Akins, okay? And Cleta Akins was a baker. And what I mean by that is she baked cookies, she baked pies, she baked cake she loved making sweet treats and when i got to the student home the name of the student home was stiegel and it was named after baron von stiegel who was a glassmaker and i walked into the kitchen and she asked me my name and there were a bunch of fellas in the kitchen with her which i didn't know any of them I obviously was locked into the protective mode and I began to stammer and she stopped me and she told all the boys if she ever caught any one of them making fun of me, that, that everyone else would go on what was called the gravy train. And that meant that this one student was going to do all the chores of the 15 other students. They were going to wash every dish, scrub every pot, uh, sweep, uh, mop, and polish every floor. And we were going to spend the next 30 days playing our lights out. And so the other students knew what the gravy train meant. And so they decided, yeah, I'm never going to make fun of him. <laughs> and, you know, she really gave me the space to really allow that to slow down because if no one makes you feel as if what you're doing is wrong, then event 
eventually that thing that you're doing, once you start to feel safe, it starts to disappear. <laughs> Isn't and it so amazing? Had, yeah. Like yeah. How, how she had such a big, profound um, impact on your life, you know, ultimately. Yeah. I mean, not only that, think about it. I, I left this out of the book, but we can talk about this because I think it's important. I was, um, I bit my nails, I stammer, stammered, and I wet the bed. Mm-hmm. And so imagine here you are in a boarding school, there's 15 other boys in my student home, and every morning I have to take my sheets down every morning in front of all the other boys, wash them, and then hang them up to dry. And then the other student home homes can see the back of our student home and I'm the student who's out there hanging their sheets because they're wetting their bed you know so that could have been potentially extremely embarrassing but she she made it very comfortable for me and then by the time I was in seventh grade I stopped wetting the bed Mm. so cool and and I stopped stammering I stopped biting my nails all of that because she provided that space for me to feel comfortable to feel safe. And if I'm understanding, Christopher, you kind of tapped into oh, your yes. breathing at that stage and having the space for that. And and there's something that you, you speak about and it really sort of resonated with me and I, I hadn't thought of it this way before, but you talk about sort of breathing at the same intensity as your stressors or anxiety. Yes. Uh, maybe you could tell us yeah, a little bit about so, that. So um, this is a great tool for everyone. The moment you start to recognize you're feeling anxious or angry or frustrated or agitated or fearful, all you have to do is raise your breath to the level of stress that you're feeling. And as soon as your body is met with that level of inspiration and expiration, what happens automatically is the anxiety dissolves that quick. And when I was in Milne Hershey School, uh, they sent me to also see a, a speech pathologist. And he noticed that I was holding my abdomen tight and I wasn't breathing. So he said, okay, what you're gonna do before you speak is taking a deep breath, exhale, taking another breath, and then talk. And I was like, okay, Mr. Millard, which is a funny name. You know, when you're a kid, Mr. Millard, who's Mr. Millard? <laughs> he's he's going to help you speak better. Okay. So I started to get in touch with the impact of breath and stress at a very young age. And then as I started working with people, one day as I was walking up and down the back of someone's legs, I heard a little voice tell me to tell them, hey, I want you to breathe relative to the level of discomfort that you're feeling. And their discomfort level was a nine out of 10, which means it was really, 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 really high. And as they brought their breath up to a nine, okay, which means you're breathing, a 10 would be as deep and as fast as you can breathe. So a nine would be slightly under that. A one would be the way that you're breathing right now, okay? So they brought their breath up to a nine. And suddenly, all the discomfort and pain that they were feeling was gone that fast. That quick. So then I started to realize, oh, I get it. The reason why they're holding all this tension and pain in their bodies because when they were stressed, they refused to breathe in that moment. And that got locked into their nervous system. So whenever I'm working with anyone, it's always a requirement that they have their breath at the same level of comfort or discomfort that they're feeling. Great tool. Yeah, it's amazing how it's actually the simple things in life, which can really help us so much. Eh? And, and I, I discovered breathing a few years ago. Um, and I think it was actually through Wim Hof uh, and he did his like sort of 10 week course on breathing. And it just, 
you know, it just had such like profound effects on, on, on so many different things and so many different levels. And then you look at his Facebook group and all these people just literally through breathing and like exposure to cold water and stuff. They're just like overcoming like issues and diseases and stuff that they've had for like 20 years. And it's purely through, through, you know, proper breathing or deep breathing and, and exposing yourself to cold water and stuff. And it's just amazing that that is, that has such healing powers. Yeah. I mean, you think about it, everyone was exposed, like, let's go back 200 years. Okay. Everybody was exposed to cold water Mm -hmm. because if you wanted to get clean, what did you have to do? You had to jump in the river. You had to jump in the Creek. You had to jump in the pond. Okay. And the water was cold. (laughs) (laughs) The only people who had warm water were people who had money. The rest of the planet, which is the majority of the planet, okay, had cold water. And when you jump in a cold river, guess what happens? You start breathing. (laughs) Six o'clock in the morning, you got to jump in the river. You're going to breathe really fast and hard to get clean. And so that was part of our actual process. Let's go back, you know, 10,000 years. Let's go back 50,000 years. That's what we did. Mm -hmm. And then along the way, as we got more comfortable and it became more difficult to express yourself authentically, people stopped breathing because they didn't want other people to know that they were upset or they were finding difficulty with what the other person was sharing. And so they learned to what I call clinch, contract. And when you contract, you hold. And that aspect of yourself that you're holding in contraction, it stays there until you take it out. Mm -hmm. And you've either got to use movement or you've got to use breath. And the best situation is to use movement, breath, and meditation simultaneously so you can start to remove this stagnant energy that's been passed off to you. I mean, imagine if you're a little kid here you are, you're in this experience with your parents and your, and your siblings, and your dad has a certain way of being. He becomes very stoic whenever your mom points out anything that he's doing wrong. So as a young man, what do you learn? You learn that stoicism is a very powerful tool. And now you're in a relationship. Here it is, years later, and your wife, she wants to inform you about something for you to look at that's impacting the kids or the household in a negative way. And your only tool is stoicism. I mean, look, she loves you. She cares about you, but try that on for 30 years. Okay. Eventually she's going to get frustrated and agitated enough where maybe she's going to think that I think I'd rather be in a relationship with someone else. And so as men, and I know this from my own experiences, stoicism is our go-to button. What if we taught young men from a very young age that, hey, look, your go-to button from now on is going to be breathing. I can see your stress, junior. Let's go sit in a yard and take a couple deep breaths. Something as simple as that could begin to awaken and change humanity. It's a crazy so, pattern that we get told, told of things, you know, like that's okay. This is the only thing that's acceptable. And even what I, when you were talking about the tummy and the breathing, I, I, I was thinking in the modern world, we're not even allowed to relax our tummies and mm-hmm. let it sort of even aesthetically, you know, just relax it and, and allow it to breathe into it because it might stick out a little bit and people will judge you for that. So it's not even only the emotional uh it's like just someone looking at you and aesthetically not 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 allowing that and there's so many layers to this when you start thinking about it yeah i totally agree you know i had a, a a woman that i worked with recently and uh and she sent me a text message because she wanted to stop doing one of the exercises because she felt like her belly was getting too relaxed And I thought, well, the stretch that I taught you is for your legs. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if your belly's starting to soften a little bit and relax, that's probably a good thing. Mm -hmm. 
Let me ask you this. Are you happier? Oh, I'm way happier. Do you have more energy? Oh, I have way more energy. But, but her focus, as you're pointing out, was on the aesthetic. And she was willing to abandon the exercise that makes her feel more free, more comfortable, and more energetic in order to look a certain way to other people or to herself. It's crazy, but there's so many uh, layers to us as humans, aren't there? We, we're such complicated yes. creatures <laughs> in so many regards <laughs> and, and make our lives difficult, that's for sure. Um, but you, you touched on a word there. You said earlier on, you said comfortable, but uh, you know the opposite to that is obviously uncomfortable. And when you were 22 years old, uh, just after the Gulf War, you went to um, sort of um, enroll in the Navy SEALs. Yeah. And I mean, like, you know, sure, you hear crazy stories about the Navy SEALs, and, and I can only imagine um, like how tough it is and how com uncomfortable those first few weeks are. But, but could you tell us a little bit about those sort of first few weeks, what the training is like? Yeah, well, those first few weeks were eye-opening for me. Uh, and one of the things that's... Uh, it's kind of like this. Imagine getting up and every moment of the day you're active and you're working out. And there's no walking anywhere. So when you're in SEAL training, you have to run everywhere. So if you're going to the doctor's office, you got to run to the doctor's office. If you're going to eat some food for lunch, you have to run to the mess hall. If you're going to the bathroom, you have to run to the bathroom. Like literally everywhere you go, you're always in high intensity motion. And I remember at one point looking up to the sky, asking God, like, why am I here? And I remember hearing what you're doing now has nothing to do with now. It's something for the future. And I thought, okay it'll have impact on lives later. And so I understood probably within like the first four weeks that there was, that the reason for me being there, there was a much bigger mission. And I had no idea that it was about ruining my body mm. so that I could learn and figure out how to put it back together. Obviously with the help of other people as well. Mm. And, you know, those first few weeks, man, I mean, you're sore. You're like, uh, you're, you're just a walking ball of soreness. And they always have you doing like 30 different forms of ab exercises, okay? Because you gotta have the core of your body's gotta be really strong. And we do a lot of the work in the sand and then on this hard blacktop area. So there's no soft mats or shiny, slippery wood, right? You're either in the hot sand and this hot sand is getting down the back of your pants. And so every time you're doing a sit up, it's wearing away at the skin. And what they call it is a raspberry. And, and everyone gets one. And at some point, you've got to be asking yourself, why am I doing this to myself? <laughs> <laughs> uh, luckily, you were very connected to source and it gave you the answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It gave me the answer for sure. And the good thing about SEAL training is it's very competitive. And you start to learn really quickly is, is that the guys that are the biggest and the strongest aren't necessarily, and the fastest aren't necessarily the guys that are going to make it through the program. It's the guys that have the most grit. Hmm. Hmm. The guys that have a good sense of self and a good inner self-esteem. Hmm. Those are the guys that are going to make it. Cause I saw a lot of big guys, a lot of, uh, athletes a lot of really smart guys and um those guys they they don't make it through i mean you've got to have a good combination of physical emotional mental and spiritual intelligence hmm. and, and christopher there was something else that that you also took as a sort of a positive other than the, the grit and that kind of thing and 
and that was uh, sort of camaraderie that you that you have. There. Oh yeah. And um, you, you also saw the military, as I understand, as a bit of a, a rite of passage. So yeah. we were just wondering, like, what are your thoughts on uh, rites of passage and a kind of initiation for people, and especially young men? You kind of touched on it a, a few moments ago um, in the modern world. Well, I mean, in the modern world, the challenge is we have very few rites of passage, and many of the rites of passage that are developed out there are focused on the males destroying themselves in the process. You know, uh, the first thing uh, to go into is that the camaraderie and SEAL training was amazing. I mean, there you are, you're working as a, as a team, you're working as a boat crew. So they break us up in, into, um, into groups of seven, okay? Um, and we're there as boat crews and every, the, the boat crews have races. So we, we, we race each other. And when we race each other and we win, the team that wins gets more rest. And rest is something very valuable in SEAL training. Uh, because a little extra rest could be the difference between getting a major injury and not getting a major injury. And you get a major injury and you get rolled out of the program. And so it's of your benefit to be with in a boat crew with guys that are open to putting out 110% of their effort. The challenge in modern day society for me is that we have very few safe rites of passage for young men. And it's important, it's so important. When I walked across the stage at SEAL training and they handed me my certificate, I knew at that moment I was definitely a man. And that no matter what, I could make my way through anything that, that I was unstoppable in regards to what I wanted to experience or what I wanted to achieve. It's seriously amazing, Christopher, like um, what tough exercise can do for our kind of mental strength. Um, yeah. I think like, you know, there, there's that definitely that sort of uh, mind body connection and, and it can definitely the, the two definitely go hand in hand so I can imagine you learned learned a hell of a ton from being in the seals but um, you know ignoring signs is something that we've all done in terms of when it comes to our bodies uh, but every day in seal training you were getting tighter and you were closing in emotionally um, but you ignored yeah. those signs um, that going at like 110 percent you know uh, was basically slowly killing you. And even though you looked like you were in amazing shape, uh, by the age of 29, you were actually reading lips, you were losing your vision, um, you barely slept and you spent your days like a zombie. And then I think it was just after you were involved in a car accident, um, it was a point when you did something in your life that, that you had never done before and you asked for help. Um, why did you ask for help at that time in your life? Um, who did you ask and how did it change you? Okay, that's a lot. Um, I asked a guy named Jeff Higgs that I was in, went through SEAL training with at the same time. We were in different classes. And, um, you know, I trusted Jeff a lot. And the discomfort was... I could never get away from it. There was, there was never a break from the throbbing in the middle of my hip after the car accident. And all the other stuff I could, I could deal with. Uh, yet yeah, this type of discomfort, it's with you every moment of the day. Um, anyone who's ever had a toothache knows what I mean. Uh, until you go and you see the dentist and he helps you resolve that toothache, that ache is going morning, noon, and night. And yeah, I took some Advil and some, some Motrin, um, some, some ibuprofen, yet nothing was going to tackle this thing. So whether I was running, hopping, skipping, jumping, sitting, laying, whatever position I was in, it was always, it always had my attention. 
And so I had to reach out and ask for help. And that for me, which I share a lot with people, was very vulnerable because that was the first time. Because when I was in boarding school and all the other experiences that I was in, if you were in pain, you learned to deal with it. And I had to learn to deal with it at a young age because I had to learn how to self-soothe. Because when you go to boarding school, it's not like the house parents are like your grandma. You know, they've got 16 different boys from 16 different places in the world with 16 different emotional dynamics going on and everything is delivered in a general fashion. And so there was never anyone investigating how I was feeling. And because there was no one investigating how I was feeling, I never learned how to let other people in on my feelings meaning the ones that were uncomfortable. I could let anyone in on the things that were comfortable, but to let anyone in on the shadow part of me was very difficult to do. And I mean, it's still some, I talk about it today, yet it's my still my knee jerk reaction uh, to certain things is to deal with them on my own. Hmm. And you know, once you get locked into what I call the lone wolf mode, it's very difficult to get out of that. And Jeff did me a good service by coming over and helping and teaching and educating me about things that would be good for me to investigate. You know, he was never pushy. He was never do it this way or do it like that. He opened the door for me to go, oh, there's a different way. And I respected him because of how he was as a person. When he was into something, he was all in. And he added a lot of great value to my life. And as a man, you know, I know from Pennsylvania, um, I'm trying to think if we ever had a conversation about feelings. Hmm. I mean, even with my friends, I mean, we joked in boarding school because that's what you do. You make fun of each other. You know, when I was in the SEAL teams and SEAL training, what do we do? We make fun of each other, right? But we never had an open, honest conversation about the negative things that were going on. You just kind of put those under the rug and you kept moving on as if everything was okay. And I had become very masterful at that. What I was unaware of at the time is that there was a cost to living that way. There was a cost to putting my attention on everything outside of me and not learning or inviting anyone in to teach me how to put the attention on the inside of me. And that all started to shift once I started to remove tension from my body. Now I was well aware of how I was being impacted by everything going on around me. Mm-hmm. And I was willing to share. I was willing to talk about things that most people wouldn't talk about that actually were uncomfortable for people. Because I remember being at dinners and lunches with people and saying certain things and, and them finding difficulty with dealing with what I was sharing because no one was doing that at the time. Mm-hmm. Can you give an example of like the sort of stuff you would say? Uh, you know, I might say, <laughs> I might, I might be at a table and go, Hey, you know, I went to the bathroom this morning and from those hot peppers that I ate, my asshole is still burning. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, yes, everyone would start laughing, but at the same time I could feel them going, Oh my God, he said this yeah. in public. <laughs> And so, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're, when you're coming out and sharing things that you would never share or taboo before to talk about, then, you know, it's, it's, it shocks a person's nervous system. Mm-hmm. And so then I had to learn like, oh, I have to be mindful of the way in which I share the environment that I'm in and who I share it with because they could take this sharing and this openness and turn it into something different than what it is. Mm. Mm. It, it's so interesting, isn't it? Like you, 
when you go on this path of sort of understanding yourself and others and how we operate, it becomes so much easier to just go to the layer deeper right at the beginning of meeting someone. And you kind of just want to, you want to ask them deep soulful questions about themselves. And, you know, like you say, you have to sometimes curtail some of the stuff that you're saying because you, there's some frivolous stuff that people feel comfortable with first that, that, then your nervous system, maybe then it's okay to go deeper. And, and it's also, it is important to understand that form of communication, but uh, ultimately, yeah. you know, you want to get to that deeper layer. Um, but it would, something funny with that story, Christopher, was that you didn't even know like what yoga was really. And like, you know, you rocked up there and you're like, what is a yoga mat? And I thought that was classic because <laughs> you've come a long way. <laughs> yeah. Like what's a yoga mat and what's a juice? You can remember I'm living in Southern California at the time. Right. So you can imagine what my lifestyle is and the people I'm hanging out with. If I have no idea what a juicer is and a yoga mat is in 2000, right? 1999. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, classic. yeah so so christopher you ended up going on a, like a four-day intensive healing in, in san jose yes and something happened at the airport on your return from that um, and you just knew that something had shifted in your head yeah you know uh i observed this phenomena whenever i was in public people would always walk around me and when I was in SEAL training in the SEAL teams, you're with guys that have been through similar experiences. And so it's difficult for you to recognize when you're amongst them that you're different than other people because when you're in SEAL training in the SEAL teams, the only guys you hang out with are guys in the SEAL teams and SEAL training and their girlfriends and or wives. That's it. That's the only people you hang out with because you got a different frequency, you got a different vibration, and it's difficult for other people to relate to that. I, I was in the dark about that. Mm. What I was aware of is that I would be taking a beeline, a straight path towards something, let's say a watermelon at a fruit stand, and I was, I, I was gonna get there quickly, and I would see other people would move away from my intensity. And after I spent four days in San Jose and I went back to the airport, people were bumping into me. So I went through SEAL training in 1990, 91, 92. SEAL teams, I got out in beginning of 97. So you figure that's a long time for me to have a certain type of experience with humans and now for it to be 2001 and i'm getting knocked around like a almost like a pinball inside of a pinball machine for the first time like if you took a baseball you could put it inside a pinball machine a baseball would be like what's going on here this is a very <laughs> unusual experience for me <laughs> i'm used to just being thrown in a straight line and uh that, that was a wake up that was a wake up call that got my attention because I'm somebody that's really good at observing everything around me. Mm. And I said, okay, something's different. People feel comfortable bumping into me now. And rather than being offended by it, I was sort of taken back and curious. What did you look like at the time? If you don't mind me asking, like, you know, now for maybe people who are listening, you're, you're sitting here and you hold like an amazing presence. You've got like long hair, dreads and stuff like, and, and you, you know, you're not, you're not massive, you're well built, but I can imagine back then, maybe you looked a little bit different. Do you think that had anything to do with it at all? Oh, I think that had a lot to do with it because um, I'd say my upper body, I probably held maybe about 15 to 25 more pounds mm -hmm. um and then as i started taking tension and stress out of my body my body started to balance out between top to bottom so i was no longer like uh what do i call upper body dominant mm -hmm. and uh you know i remember i would go places 
and uh, friends of mine would touch my arms and be like, dude, your arms are like steel, right? You're like stone. And I was like, yeah, I'm like stone. <laughs> <laughs> and now I look back and I'm like, I was like stone. That's not good. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I would say probably from the way that people would have seen me and the way in which I moved, I had an intimidating presence. Mm -hmm. Yet I had no clue that I had an intimidating presence because inside I still felt soft and kind and curious and all those kinds of things. It was as my energy came through this filter of tension it changed the way that people perceived me. That's amazing, bud. Um, and look, you, you know, since, since that time, you've obviously carried on and done a hell of a lot of different learnings and um, experiences and retreats and I guess, and all these type of things. And, and one of the things which is extremely fascinating um, is you did a month long dark uh, room meditation um, yes. retreat. Like, I actually listened to a podcast the other day. It was the first time this had actually come up. I didn't really know it was something that existed, but it just sounded incredible. And that was only a week the guy spoke about, and you're talking about a month. I mean, can you tell us a little bit about that and maybe go into the sort of psychological part? You know, did you have any DMT experiences and that sort of stuff as well? Oh, I mean, my darkroom experience is probably one of the most powerful experiences any human can ever have on this planet. Uh, and the reason why I say that is this, a buddy of mine at the time I was studying Chinese medicine at a school named Pacific college of Oriental medicine in San Diego. And a buddy of mine named Dave, um, he put this pamphlet inside of my mailbox and I went and I opened it and it said something about the dark room experience. And I looked at all the benefits. And as soon as I saw that, it's like every once in a while, for me, I have these experiences in life and I see something and the moment I see it, I know I need to do that immediately. And I read it and I thought, yes, this is the place for me. So I went there and there were 60 people in this experience, okay? And it took place in Chiang Mai, Thailand at the Tao Gardens. And the teacher there is a guy named Montak Chia. And I had heard his name before, yet I had never really got into his stuff and his teachings and his learnings. All I knew was I was supposed to go to this darkroom experience. Well, the other 59 people had been studying with this guy for years. And they showed up weeks in advance of this dark room. I got there literally the day before I wake up the morning of, and guess what happens? I've got this ache in my tooth. Oh. So I got to spend the afternoon at a dentist in Thailand. Okay. <laughs> taking me through this procedure where they're going to numb, you know, one of the nerves in my teeth and then they decide they're going to take the nerve out. Wow. And now I got to go back into the dark. I got to go back into this experience. I don't know anyone that's in there. I literally get there 10 minutes before they turn the lights off. <laughs> I can remember where my room is. And, uh, and the next morning, when we come down, we have to start doing these Taoist exercises. And I'm, so the people that are beside me, I'm like touching their bodies to figure out what position they're in. I got no clue what we're doing. And it's, it's just to, to clarify, it, it's like absolutely dark in there for people. No, I mean, there is zero photons of light available. Wow. And your eyes are closed and you have an eye mask on the entire time. And the reason for the eye mask is so that you keep your eyes closed. Because if you open your eyes in complete darkness, you burn out your retinas because the retina is going to be searching for photons of light that don't exist. Hmm. So it's absolute darkness. Hmm. By the third day, I figured out the positions and the moves and everything we need to be doing. And uh, 
I think I went to go down and get my food for lunch. And I hear this little ding, this thing goes dink. And on the corner of my right eye, and then 10 seconds later, dink, the corner of my left eye, there's like these two little flashlights. I'm like, this is weird. And I think later on that day, we went through a meditation called walking the something, walking through the doorway of life or something. And I open up this door through this meditation and I walk outside. And suddenly, I'm at the edge of Earth. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm looking out at all of the stars. And then suddenly up to my left is this um, very giant creature uh, made of steel. And he's a dragon. And his name is Draco. And he's the keeper of the Zodiac. And he's going to show me how a soul falls to earth. And I spent three days traveling around with this guy. So imagine my body is still in the experience, but everything that my third eye is looking at and everything that I'm feeling is coming from that dimension that I'm in with him. Hmm. And it was a really, really, really uh, powerful experience. And I got to travel. I ascended to the surface of a planet named Sirius A. Okay. And it took me 14 days to go through the ascension process. And as I ascended to the surface of Sirius A, I looked to my left. Now, the thing, what they were doing is they were training me when I was in the dark room. And I don't mean Montauk Chi and all those people. I mean, the people that I was relating with Mm. looking through my third eye. And they kept taking me through these catacombs. And any time that I would look left, they would take the experience away from me. Any time that I would look right, they would take the experience away from me because they only wanted me to look at what was directly in front of me. And when you're doing that 14, 16 hours a day, Hmm. I understood later why they were doing that. Because once I ascended to the surface of Sirius A, I saw this enormous blue planet to my left, and I took a quick look, and it was Sirius B. And Sirius B is so bright, it almost burned out my retinas. My eyes were throbbing for days afterwards from literally, I got to look at Sirius B for maybe a half a second. And the power of looking at something that close to you uh, was, was, it was, it was too much for me. So then what happened is the spirited horsemen showed up and they, they took me across the universe on this cloud And we ended up at this place called the Field of Souls. And I was there and and remember, I was dipping in and out of different uh, experiences. And so, and they kept showing me this school with children and building peace flags. And then I'd be, then I'd be back at the Field of Souls and I'd be there for three hours. And then, and then I would be, in another place, having this experience. And this went on for 28 days straight. Mm. And no matter what I was doing with Montauk Chi in terms of the meditations, the exercises, eating lunch, communicating, this was going on the entire time in my third eye. So whether my eyes were opened or closed, it's the only thing that I could see. So I had to be physically present because I'm moving around in complete darkness. So imagine, uh, imagine that kind of training going on. So for me, it, it was it was wild and it was awesome. All my senses increased, my smell, my hearing, uh, my sense of space. Like I could feel before I was getting ready to walk into a wall or a chair, I could feel it. Maybe eight 
10, 12 inches before, suddenly I would feel the density of energy and then I would stop, I'd put my hand out and boom, there would be a chair. And here's the most fascinating thing. Imagine there's 60 people walking around and moving around. I never once bumped into one person in 28 days. Why? That's how heightened the senses are. Mm. I could feel, I'd be like, ooh, there's somebody right here. And I'd reach out. Yep, there'd be someone right there. Mm. I'd go, excuse me. And I'd move around them. (laughs) And so it got to the point where I could tell where my mat was. So everyone had their like little stretching mat, stretching bed area. And um, every day that I reached out to touch my mat, it was always my mat and never anyone else's mat. (laughs) And imagine, this is an enormous place. And it was very, 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 very powerful, very unique. I suggested for everyone to start to investigate into the darkroom experience. Uh, Because the Northern Europeans have been doing a lot of research in darkroom experiences for a very, very long time. And they have a lot of science behind it. And so, and Montauk Chia has a, an inor- he's like a wealth of knowledge. And he educates and teaches and guides and he's extremely generous. He never wants to control you. He never tells you how to do anything. He's, he's a true teacher. And Christopher, just quickly, what, what, what were you tapping into in your mind? Like, what do you think? Were you tapping into a higher dimension? Or were you tapping into source? Or what do you think when you're going on this journey with, you know, through the universe and, and to Sirius A and these kind of things? What do you think that was? Well, for me, uh, each human before they come to earth has a level of development that they've attained. Okay. And so I think my experience was I was meant to ascend. And so I went through a full blown ascension process uh, in this lifetime. What I didn't understand when I was doing all the stretching and the fasting, I had no idea that I was preparing myself to go through an ascension process. Mm. And so that's what they were offering me for all the good, solid work that I did. Because, you know, for those seven years where I was working on myself with my buddies, uh, I was really, really, really focused. Okay, I fat, all I really did was heal, fast, cleanse, stretch, open. I was completely devoted to the process of, I guess people would call it awakening. I didn't call it awakening. I was only attempting to get out of the hell that I had been living in. And once I got the first taste of freedom, I decided that I was going to devote all my time to it and see how far I could take it. And the one driver for me was always... Why do you want to be in this experience? Because I want to know love at its greatest measure. And I used all of these experiences to get further and further and further. When I went to Thailand, I had no clue why I was supposed to go to the dark room. I only knew I was supposed to be there. And then they interview people afterwards and no one was having the experience that I was having. And then I was like, oh, I get it. Before you go to the dark room, you should spend seven years de-stressing, detensing, detoxing, and de-distorting so that when you get into an experience like that, you can then ascend to the next level of development. And they showed me the process that every soul goes through in order to fall to earth. I mean, I got to see with my own eyes, feel with my own feelings. And so from that moment forward, there's no way for anyone to ever convince me that these other things do not exist. Mm -hmm. Because once you go through something like that, you're like, oh, nobody knows that this stuff is actually real. Like, I, I didn't study 
Taoism. So the last week when you're in the dark room, you go through a meditation called the sealing the five senses. And the first day, he has you tap on your organs. And when you tap on your organs, you see a certain color. And I thought, okay. And then there's a part of me that said to myself, well, he told me it's green, so maybe that's why I'm seeing it green, right? So I tapped on my liver, and then this beautiful fluorescent green. Every time I tapped, whoosh, tap, whoosh. And then he had me tap on my spleen. And then we get to tapping on the lungs, and it's this white color comes out. And he goes, okay, now tap on your heart. And I tap, and I said, Master Chi, I keep tapping, and it's white. He goes, where are you tapping? I said, in the middle of my chest. He said, your heart's to the left. <laughs> and I tapped on the left, and of course, as soon as I tapped to the left, it was red. But see, when I was tapping on the middle of my chest, I thought I was tapping my heart, but I was tapping my lung channel. And so, of course, it was showing white, which then proved to me that, oh, this wasn't my mind telling me this. Mm. Okay. So, um, I think God wanted to give me the opportunity to see everything that I saw so that I could speak and teach with confidence. And I could understand that there's a much bigger thing happening here. And that would help me serve more powerfully because that was the effect. <laughs> well, Christopher, that's an amazing, amazing story. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, oh, you're and I welcome. Think, uh, that's definitely one of those dinner table stories that could open someone's eyes a little bit uh, if you've just met them. <laughs> oh, yeah. They're like, whoa, this guy's a little too much for me. <laughs> And here's what I loved about it. Remember, you were having the DMT experience. It was endogenous versus exogenous, mm -hmm. right? And so whenever you're having an endogenous DMT experience, it's actually healing your brain. The challenge is when you're having an exogenous, which means you're putting a substance in your body to have a DMT experience, you're actually damaging your brain, meaning there's the cost. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're going to have that experience, but there's a cost to having that experience. And when I was in Thailand, there were a couple people that went to the darkroom experience, and the reason why they were there was to heal from having a DMT experience that they had in the jungles of South America that actually fractured their consciousness. And then by the end of the three weeks of them being in the dark room and it came back out, their, the DMT, the endogenous experience, had actually healed their brain and healed the fracture. And so that's when I got really hip to like, oh, okay, if I'm going to, I'm more willing to do, if I want to have a spiritual experience, I'm going to do the intense work required to have that naturally. Okay. If someone wants to bypass all of that work, they can end up having a unique experience. The challenge is that there's a cost and the cost is to their brain and your brain is your crown chakra. It's your connection between you and God. And so why would you ever knock the jewels out of your crown in order to have an experience? I said, listen, I can have that experience seven years down the road and I can have it for almost 25 days straight every second of the day versus this three hour experience from this drink that I drink that could potentially cause me a lot of harm. I'm going to take the seven year road. People are not because to do the work. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, all, I'm always, that's the difference between me and other people. I'm always willing to do the work. And that's the thing that helped. I understand now why I went through SEAL training. I was in the SEAL teams. Because you got to be willing to put in the work, to put in time, to put in the effort that it takes in order to have an extraordinary experience. 
well, Christopher, these have all, these experiences have really brought you to a place where you are now a healer as well. You know, you, uh, yeah. it's such an ultimate journey that you've enabled yourself to get to that point of understanding through all these things. Uh, and you've actually written a book, uh, which is called Free Your Life, Free for Life, sorry, uh, A Navy Seal's Path to Inner Freedom and Outer Peace, uh, off the back of all these learnings that you've done and, and basically to help others uh, and give them a, a way to heal through, their tra- through, through trauma and things like that, uh, or heal their traumas. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your true body intelligence system uh, that you teach. Okay. Well, the book, we'll go there first. The book... I want people to know from the book that it's possible, okay? Meaning here I was, I went through all these traumatic experiences as a kid, okay? That drove me down a path to cause me to use my coping strategies as part of my identity. And then to take those coping strategies as far as they would go in terms of an extreme way of living. And then to see that those coping strategies led me as far away from myself as I could be. And then to break all of those coping strategies down to get back to my center line to find out who I am. And then be able to take that work and to be able to take anyone in the world who's been at an extreme level, okay, of experiencing and bring them back to their midline so they can find out who they really are. I mean, that was the purpose of the book, for them to know that that's actually possible. Because if I could get back from the hell that I was in, in the extreme ways in which I was functioning, any human can regardless of what they've been through, because I've been through the worst types of abuses that you could ever be be through. Okay. Day two, they broke my legs and reset them in cast. Day one, they, um, well, most men go through that experience. Okay. They traumatize my body uh, by removing my foreskin. Okay. Um, I spent my first 10 days in a room basically by myself because my mother was going through her own emotional challenges, not knowing what her life was going to be like after having me. And then to go to the babysitter, putting my hands on a gas stove, to go through deep senses of of abandonment. And to make it through the world and to come back to living in peace and devoting my life to service and helping others get happy, get free, get present. I mean, that's really what the book was about. Because once you understand that that's possible, now you might think, hmm, you know what? I'm gonna take a risk. Yet, if you don't know it's possible, then there's no way for you to take a risk. And so the systems, true body intelligence, was born out of all of the things that I put myself through, okay? The only time I'm willing to share something is when I've put myself through it for thousands of hours. I'm very different. I might go to a class and learn something until I've put myself through that learning and I can see from the inside out and feel from the inside out what that experience, what it actually really provides, I'm unwilling to do that with anyone. So true body intelligence is everything, not everything, but a lot of what I used in order to put myself back together. And the system, the beautiful thing about the work in true body intelligence, it does what it says and it says what it does. Okay. My motto is this under promise and over deliver. And the systems and true body intelligence, relative to what's available out there, okay, because I've done everything. So I get I got a clear understanding of what's useful and how far it can take you. True body intelligence is the distillation of all of those things that I learned and went through so that others can get free. 
And if you put these practices to the test, you will get free too. Whether it's addiction, whether it's uh, headaches, whether it's poor sleeping patterns, where it's an inability to communicate, whether it's erectile dysfunctions, whether it's uh, whatever it is, whatever stressor that you have that's creating this state of dis-ease in your life, those systems will help you move back to the center line and allow you to regain balance in your nervous system. It's about the nervous system. When your nervous system calms down, you're in the receptive mode. When you're in the protective mode, you're, in a, you're locked into an inappropriate stress state, which means you're stuck in a state of dis-ease. If you've got cancer, you're stuck in a, protect, in, in a protective state. If, you got, if you're an insomniac, you're stuck in a protective state. If you have an inability to communicate, you're stuck in a protective state. If you have an inability to authentically self-express, you're in a protective state. If you're greedy, if you're dishonest, if you're depressed, if you're angry, if you're, uh, if you're sadistic, if you're self-defeating and masochistic, whatever it is, those things are showing you you're locked into a protective state. True body intelligence is made up of modalities and systems that get you, that pull you out of that inappropriate stress state by creating a pattern interrupt. If we interrupt a pattern successfully, you now have to create a new pattern. And in that new pattern, you discover you. Sounds super powerful, that, and I can imagine just by that list of things that you said, sounds like all of us have these things that are holding us back and yeah. we need to work on them, basically. Yeah, you need to. I mean, look, I'll be honest with you. There's no substitute for meditation. There's no substitute for good nutrition. There's no substitute for powerful sleep patterns. There's no substitute for clear communication in your life. There's no substitute for leadership, okay? But th there's also no substitute for removing tension, stress, and distortion that's locked into your physical body, your emotional body, your mental body, and your energetic body. And if you, you refuse to remove these, you end up with a limited life experience. And look, life is too short to have a limited life experience if, if at the end of the day, the greatest experience that's available is to love yourself and to love each other equally. Then you have no choice but to put your focus on removing everything that's in the way of the experience of that love. So, so Christopher, can you give like say two practical things, you know, like that people can do to love themselves more. Uh, okay. Two practical things. The first thing is I'm going to give you a list of daily drugs and I suggest that you remove one of them a month for the next six months, okay? Top of the list, white refined sugar, sugar cane, and brown sugar. The reason for that, very simple, they are, the, they are highly addictive substances that have the same effect on your brain as cocaine. But because they're acceptable, we use them daily. So first, second, caffeine. Caffeine puts your nervous system immediately into a state of fight or flight, okay? Next, alcohol. Next, nicotine. Next, food colorings. Next, preservatives remove those from your diet and i promise you take your time 
ease yourself out of them. If you're someone who eats six cookies a night, have three the next week. The next week, have two. The next week, have one. The next week, have a half of one. The next week, find a cookie that's made from whole grains that does not have white sugar in it. Maybe you substitute coconut sugar or date sugar or agave or stevia, but get your body away from addictive substances. That's the most practical thing you can do because when you calm your stomach down, you know what happens is you start authentically self-expressing and you start communicating clearly about the things that are important to you. Yet, when you refuse to communicate clearly about the th things that are important to you and self-express about the things that are important to you, you know what happens is you get locked in and attracted to addictive substances. So take the excess heat out of the stomach by moving yourself away from the daily drugs. Sugar, caffeine, nicotine, alcohol, preservatives, food colorings. And of course, recreational drugs. Okay, because you want to be able to feel and when you take these substances, they numb you out. And if you can't feel, how are you ever going to make a different decision? So okay. that's my first practical step. Second practical step. Have a psychic conversation with the top 10 people that you've been dishonest with in your life. Get out a sheet of paper and a pen and write down the top 10 people that you've been dishonest with and have that conversation with them psychically, not face to face, have it psychically, tune into them and speak from your heart and get whatever you got to get off your chest. Okay, get rid of the substances and start having honest psychic conversations with the people that you've been dishonest with. That's very powerful. Thanks a lot for sharing that, Bud. Um, the conversations, are they just what you've been just honest about, what you have been dishonest about, or just yes. kind of whatever, like something, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the conversation is, one, what you've been dishonest about, the reason why you were dishonest, okay, and your own inner deficiency around being honest. You know, some people, most humans, uh, the reason why they're dishonest is because they're avoiding punishment, rejection, humiliation, or violence. And they learn that as a young kid, okay? Whoa, if I say this, I'm going to get that, and that's not going to feel good. So let me keep that to myself. The challenge is every time you swallow, you repress those feelings and emotions, they start to stagnate your energy and they start to tighten your body. And so a way to start to bring relief is to put that person on the list and have a psychic conversation, tune into them, go, hey, mom, listen, it's me, it's your daughter, Beverly. I want to talk to you about something that's been bothering me for a long time that I've been very, it's been very difficult for me. I have difficulty coming to spend time with you on the weekends because I don't like the way that you talk to dad. You're demeaning, you're hurtful to his feelings. You shut him down every time he has something to share and I can't be around it anymore. And this is the reason why I avoid coming home on the weekends. Okay, that's a simple example. Mm. And by having that psychic conversation, they hear you. Because one of, the, one of the first major skills that all human beings have is psychic conversation. I mean, we use cell phones. I mean, that's the slow route, right? Every time I think of a buddy of mine that I haven't thought of or talked to in four or five months, you know what happens? He texts me the next day. Mm. Dude, I'm thinking about you. I'm like, I was just having a, I was just, I was just wondering how he's doing. Okay. So the psychic part of us, you got to develop that part of yourself. 
And as you have that psychic conversation, their soul can feel you. Their heart can feel you. Their mind, their nervous system can feel you. Because sometimes there's conversations that are very difficult to have out loud. Christopher, you also talk about authenticity and honesty being intrinsically linked to health. Like, yes. Wh why is that? Well, because what happens is every major quality that a human being can access is also connected to uh, a meridian, which means a channel of energy, an organ, and a way of being. And there's doing and there's being. When I'm talking about being, I'm talking about how a person is showing up. Okay, so when you're honest and you're authentically self-expressed, it means that you're informing the people around you about what's important to you. And when you inform the people around you what's important to you, you know, to you, you know what happens? You get support and you get your needs met. Yet when you're moving through life and you're helping everyone else, but none of your needs are getting met, it causes you to start running an undercurrent of resentment. And resentment is connected to the splenic and the pancreas meridian. And resentment and that undercurrent, it generates too much heat and too much anger. And then it causes you to be attracted to addictive substances, hmm. which then puts you on the train to the daily drugs. So getting people to slow down their use of the daily drugs, it's important, okay? Yet you still have to look at the underlying cause. Well, why am I attracted to that in the first place? You're attracted to that in the first place because you're running an undercurrent of resentment because you lack the ability to authentically self-express and be honest about what your needs are. Now, there's two versions of honesty. There's inner honesty and there's outer honesty. Some people, are really good at being honest with other people, but they're terrible about being honest with themselves. And other people are really honest with themselves and find it extremely difficult to be honest with someone else. So what does that mean? It means this. When I'm honest with you, I'm allowing you in on how I feel about you. When I'm honest with me, I'm allowing myself in on how I feel about you, okay? And so some people, they're terrible at letting themselves in on how they really feel because if they did, they would have to change the nature of the relationship. They would have to have a, they would have to have a conversation that's extremely uncomfortable. And so honesty and authentic self-expression are tied together. And as you become really good at these two, you know what happens? Your needs get met. You understand and that you have value beyond what you do. You're inviting people into your process going, hey, I would like you to help me with this because I feel like I deserve this. And now you start to become confident and you start to understand that you have value. And once you understand you have value, mm -hmm. you're unwilling to put things in your body or be in experiences that devalue who you are. Bad to be powerful. So amazing, man. It's just like <laughs> <laughs> constant lesson after lesson after lesson that you're just kind of throwing at us. So thank you so much for that. And kind of just, we're obviously um, getting to the end here now, but I just, just before we kind of ask our last few questions, um, one of the things that uh, Mandy and both Shelly spoke about when they spoke about you was exactly what you said there about, you know, stopping the coffee and all these other things um, before they had to come and see you, before they could come and see you. Um, but then also once they got to see you, that you, you did things like, you know, you would walk on their back to help relieve stress and stuff. So sure. can you maybe just uh, explain a little bit about like what that is and like how yeah, yeah. those things can like, I don't know, sort of um, unblock passages within us or whatever, yeah. whatever they actually do? Yeah, 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 yeah. This is great. So uh, yeah, now in order to do that, we have to, we have to go back to the beginning. So what we're going to do, we're going to tie everything that we've learned so far, and that's going to answer that question. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So imagine here you are, you're two and a half years old, you're crawling across the living room, and you see this new shiny cup sitting on the coffee table, 
and you're going to grab it and your mom says, Craig, no. And she screams that across the room, right? And then all of a sudden you sit on your bum and you start crying. And the reason why you start crying is because she used shock as a means to deter you from exploring your environment. Hmm. Okay. So now you decided, okay, whenever mom's around, I'm not going to explore shiny things that are on the coffee table. So now you start applying a strategy to avoid her rejection, her punishment, her humiliation. Once you start to apply that strategy over and over and over again, what happens is it weakens your nervous system. And when it weakens your nervous system, you become tense. Okay? So tension, weakness always precedes tension. So when people come to see me, let's say the, you know, the average person, I don't know, 38 to 52. Okay. They come to see me. They've been holding these levels of tension in their body for decades. So I begin to move my feet on top of their legs, the inside the legs, outside the legs, the back of the legs, the front of the legs, the lower legs, uh, the upper back, the, the uh, lower arms. When I start to go into this tension, what's going to happen is they're going to start to feel intensely where they've been holding their whole life. And then what's going to happen is they're going to be asked to bring their breath up to meet that level of tension that they're holding. And as soon as they do, that discomfort, that tension, that stress, it dissolves immediately. And now their body's brought back to what's called a neutral state of holding a neutral state of holding. In neutrality, we add nothing and we take nothing away. We're only in the experience. When I have an intense amount of tension in my body, I'm no longer in neutral. I'm in a vested position. I need something to look like this, sound like this, and be like this for me to know that I'm okay. All of that leads back to that initial experience when someone used shock or violence or humiliation to deter you from exploring your environment. So when Shelly and Mandy came in, the greatest gift that I can give them is the ability to begin to start to explore who it is they really are outside of all the coping strategies that they've been projecting out into the world as who they really are. Because what happens is when you begin to project a strategy into the world, your nervous system starts to recognize your coping strategy as you. And once it does that, it no longer has access to who you really are. And then what you need to do in order to survive is you have to numb out because you can't stand to feel the distance between your true self and your false self. And so going in to the back, upper back or the legs or the lower legs and moving into that tissue and having them breathe relative to that discomfort that they're feeling with my movement allows them to shed decades, decades of coping strategies that they've employed as a means of avoiding punishment, rejection, humiliation, and violence. The challenge is when you use that as a coping strategy, it makes you risk averse or it makes you too risky. You understand what I mean? Mm -hmm. You either become risk averse or you become too risky. Now, in order for me to feel like I'm alive, I need to jump my motorbike over a canyon that's 50 feet wide. <laughs> yeah, I'm alive. No, no, you are already alive, okay? There's no need to jump your canyon, you know, to, to jump the canyon with your bike, okay? So as you remove the tension and the stress and the distortion you get dropped back into a state of neutrality okay 
and people ask me to work with me. Well, wh when are we going to get to the to pleasure? And I say, listen, most human beings couldn't even handle 10 seconds of pleasure because they're so used to living in the, um, in the discomfort that the pleasure would be too much. It would bring too much anxiety. Let's get you to neutral first, get you living in a state of neutrality. Then once you're in neutrality, we can start to ascend up towards pleasure. Okay. Wow, bud. That's amazing. Once again, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, oh, and it's so, it's so true. Like, you know, people are living, yeah, like in this sort of state of tension, I guess. And, and, yeah. um, yeah. Um, well, but you, you are an amazing guy. So thank you for sharing all that stuff. And, and I guess just, just kind of, um, to kind of bring this home a little bit, uh, what are two pieces of advice that you could share with our audience that you feel have helped you a lot in your life? Uh, you know, the, the, the one that I think is the best, uh, for me personally that I, I keep revisiting is whatever I have resistance to is the, pl is the thing that I need to dive into. Whatever I have resistance to is the thing that I need to dive into. And if I have the courage, if I can summon the courage to dive into the thing where I have resistance, I'm going to end up having a much more beautiful, amazing, powerful life. Yet if I avoid the places where I'm resistant and I only surround myself with people and things that don't lean into me and make me feel uncomfortable, I'm never going to grow beyond my limitations. And your limit and the hint is your limitation is where you have resistance. If I have resistance to giving up this thing, then I, I probably, probably might be a good idea for me to look at that mm. and investigate, at the very least, investigate. Ask yourself, why? The other thing is um, that has served me powerfully is... getting to a state of intuitive discipline. Okay. So I went to boarding school in boarding school. It was imposed discipline. Okay. Then I went to the military. I volunteered for that imposed discipline. Okay. And then I had a very strict sense of discipline and then I moved into intuitive discipline and I'm going to explain this to you. Intuitive discipline is me knowing that for the next three weeks, it'd be really valuable for me to run 25 to 30 minutes every single day and not know why. And then at the end of that three weeks, figuring out what's the next thing that my body wants to do. Oh, my body wants me to stretch for the next couple of weeks intensely for an, for an hour a day where before I always had a very regimented sense of discipline. So, okay, so I'm going to get up at six o'clock. I'm going to go, go for my run. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go do that. But that never left any space for anything new, new to happen. And so I was never listening to my body. I was projecting onto my body what was good for it without ever asking, hey, what do you want to do today? I don't want to do anything. Are you sure you don't want to do anything or you don't want to do anything? No, nope. I want to lay around and do nothing today. Great. Let's do nothing. Wake up the next day. What do you want to do today? I want to stretch. Okay, let's stretch. Next day, what do you want to do today? I want to run. Okay, let's go run. How long do you want to run? I want to run for 20 minutes. Okay, that's, you sure? Only 20 minutes? Yep, yeah, but I want to run fast. Okay, let's go run fast for 20 minutes. Okay, what do you want to do the next day? I want to do anything. Okay, so do anything. Right, like, like making the best choice available with what's in front of you. 
is the key in really connecting to your body, getting in touch with what your body wants rather than forcing it to do this thing because some expert from Men's Health Magazine says that if you do this for 12 weeks straight, you're gonna end up with 2.9% body fat, right? And now I'm cutting all these calories and I can't eat this and do that. And you know, it's, it's about the life experience, but I have to realize that my mind and my body function very differently. And I've got to be willing to one, ask permission, but to be willing to co-create with my body because my body is full of billions of years of intelligence. Okay. All these micronutrients that make up all this material, they've been around on this planet forever, okay? And they might have something to offer my conscious mind that's been around for 52 years. <laughs> this the intelligence in this body, it may know a lot more, okay? And so it's handing over the power to your body, to your intuition, and asking it what it wants. Mm. But that's, that, that's amazing, man. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, wow. <laughs> Brilliant, but so, so just, um, you know, second last question Yeah, Sorry, I know we, we are uh, a bit, little bit over time, um, but what are you most excited about the future? Like, what have you got coming up? And then how can people get in touch with you? to find out more about you and follow you and these sort of things? Well, the thing that I'm most excited about is uh, this idea of scalability, meaning that the only way people could access me before is if they heard about me through someone like Mandy or someone like Shelly who had a powerful life-changing experience with me. Um, or they met someone who came to one of my my practitioner's trainings. That's the only way you could get access to the information. So the thing that I'm most excited about is one, there's a book out there that I released on September 11th purposely to create a new frequency around that energy. And two, I have a course on the internet called the eight stepping stones to inner freedom. And they get to go through eight powerful modules of education. And then I created what's called a transmutation process. So there's a difference between transformation and transmutation. Okay. Transformation is a concept out in the modern world. That's about observation and comprehension. Transmutation is about taking low base frequency and transmuting it into high base frequency. Okay, so at the end of each module, I have a transmutation process that's going to lift a level of stress out of the life that there's no other way to get it out. I mean, it's, it, um, it's so powerful. And so those are, those are the things that excite me now because it means that people can get access to the work without having to be in front of me. That's awesome, awesome man. And, and, and how, how, how can people yeah. get, sorry about it. Go ahead. You know, I was just going to say, how can they actually get in touch with you? Like what, what's, uh, you know, on, on uh, oh, well, it's easy. social I media mean, channels yeah. or websites? Oh, or... Social media channel, uh, websites. So they could go to truebodyintelligence.com. Okay. That is where they can access and get an understanding of what true body intelligence is about. Um, I had to create it in a way where the information is kind of dumbed down because uh, I don't want to be in competition with the American Medical Association, all right? Mm -hmm. Because our work is really, at the end of the day, it's about transformation. It's about personal growth. It's about being happy and finding self-love and freedom. Um, they could go to find me on LinkedIn, um, I guess Facebook, uh, Twitter, anything that has true body intelligence on it. But I would go to truebodyintelligence.com because there they can start reading blogs where I start to give education around stress. I mean, most people don't understand that the, only, the difference between the guy that wins the silver medal and the guy that wins the gold medal at the Olympics or the world championships or any championship is one is more in the receptive mode and one is more in the protective mode. And the guy that's more 
player in the receptive mode wins the gold medal. Hmm. That's the difference. The difference between uh, being the best version of yourself is how much stress you have, Hmm. right? You have all this lifetime stress inside of you and they can go to true body intelligence and find ways of getting in contact with me. There's a support email, there's a phone number there, and that's the fastest way. Beautiful. Thanks for sharing that. And our last question, Christopher, is just what does being ridiculously human mean to you? It means uh, (laughs) starting out, turning left, thinking uh, you know where you're going, and then finally giving up and following the breadcrumbs that were laid down for you to get you to be who it is you really are. Mm-hmm. That's so cool. Thank you. That's beautiful. Listen, Christopher, <laughs> it's it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. We could have definitely chatted for another hour or two because it's just so much knowledge that I, that just gets downloaded from you. It's a really great experience oh, chatting with you and being in your, in your you. space and your presence. And, you know, while you were speaking, I, I just was thinking to myself, you have this ability to smile and be soft and gentle, but hold a real confidence about you at the same time and the strength. Uh, and that's a really good skill to have, to, ha- to kind of hold both of those at the same time. And it's uh, really aspirational. And um, I think you also spoke about light and you, you just seem full of light. And I think that's due to all the work you've, you, you've been on or been through and done on yourself, but also just this, uh, I guess you just uh, have chosen to show up in the world in that way, you know? So I uh, just wanted to say thanks so much for, for that space and, and this energy that you bring and for coming on our show today. It's been an absolute uh, education and a pleasure. Well, I mean, it's been such a pleasure uh, to spend time with both of you and, uh, What I love about what we're doing here is men are convening together to provide value to people's lives around helping them grow beyond their limitations and getting information that can be useful to them and their families for the purpose of getting more deeply in touch with love. Mm -hmm. And so to be with you guys on Sunday uh, is perfect. I mean, it's a perfect day. Uh, it worked out perfectly. You guys made me feel comfortable, recognized, safe. And the space that you hold is extremely spacious. Um, I only felt recognized and valued through the entire experience. So thank you so much. Fadwar. That's such a nice thing of you to say, man. Like seriously, um, just kind of briefly from me, I, I, I just want to like sort of, you know, add on to what Craig said there about you and the presence that you hold and the sort of space you also provide. And like you, you spoke so much about love, although we didn't really get into that a lot, but I just feel this massive sense of love from you. And I think, you know, like we said in the chat, like love is probably the most powerful, the most impactful thing. And it combats almost any other force there is in the world, you know, in like a really powerful, awesome way. And, and you, you, you have the sense of a lot of it, uh, like this aura of love. So, so thank you for that, bud. And, and, and you would have heard in a lot of my, my replies, like at the end of what you said, I'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Gee, that was powerful. <laughs> and I was like, I was almost like I had to just take in what you were saying because I was like, this guy is speaking to me, you know, and what you were saying, you were just dropping so much value and I was like really having to reflect on all of your answers, um, you know, and, and, and I think like, I'm like kind of semi far down the, the, the personal development sort of space, you know, but like everything you were saying was like, wow, okay, cool. There's, there's still so much to work on, which is just so awesome as well. And, um, yeah, I just wanted to just say like, you know, like you said, it's, it's so awesome that there's, you know, three guys here. We're talking about things that are, you know, about love and feelings and these sort of things. And I think that's really powerful as well. So, you know, you're a great guy. You have an awesome smile and a great giggle and your knowledge is <laughs> profound, but so, so thank you so much, man. It's really been an inspirational oh. chat. So it's amazing. 
Well, thank you again. I mean, it feels so good to be with both of you. And, uh, you know, for me, this is the difference between being and doing, right? Mm -hmm. We're gathering together and our being, our presence is driving this opportunity to feed people, right? Because the souls, they're souls, they're, they're, they're begging for information, they're begging for knowledge, they're begging for wisdom that brings great value. I mean, if I'm going to invest time and energy and effort, because look, I'm 52 now, so I understand the value of time in a way that when I was 22, I was clueless about. Mm. I realize now there's only going to be so many people that I get to work with one-on-one. -on -one. There's only going to be so many lives that I get to impact. We might as well bring them gold and diamonds and rubies. And I feel like uh, this teamwork, this gathering together today was, was part of that pursuit, part, part of that purpose. And Likewise. I think, you know, I've done some podcasts, to be honest with you. Uh, most of them are shit. And um, they don't, they're, they, they haven't done their homework. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, my publisher sent me to these people. They didn't even take the time to read the book. They don't even know, they're asking me questions about things they don't even know what I'm talking about. And so this is actually the first podcast that I've been on where I felt like, oh, I'm actually being met. I'm actually, there's actually space to actually surf here. Like we, oh, we can be incredibly honest. We can be really truthful. And that's something that you guys are holding together. And thank you so much for holding this space down for everyone because you know mandy's got a lot to say i know shelly's got a lot to say i got to look at a lot of the other characters that have come on to your podcast and you can tell they're very powerful people and so thank you for doing your work thank you for hearing the call from god from spirits and bringing your hearts to do what you do because without guys like you the people people are gonna have less access to information that actually changes lives from the bottom to the top, left to right, back to front and in to out. We need, the universe needs people like you putting yourselves out there like this. It's essential. Right. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air, stop at the toll, 